Okay, we're going to kick off the Emerging Markets panel uh, with Ricardo Adrogue. Did I get that? Almost right? Okay. The head of emerging markets at, at Bearings. Um, to my right here, Wei Hong, principal at General Atlantic, focused on Asia, uh, predominantly Southeast Asia, right? To my left, Penny Foley, uh, group managing director, emerging markets at TCW. Uh, to her left, Mona um, Stuppen? Stuppen. Stuppen. Yep. Uh, partner, macro advisory partners. And then uh, all the way at the end, Anne Von Prague, Managing Director, Moody's Investor Services. This is certainly a lot to talk about, but I want to give each panelist the time to really um, uh, focus on the areas that interest them. So just broadly speaking, if Ricardo, if you want to kick it off and give us a sense of um, where the opportunities uh, and potentially risks lie for, for investors in emerging markets these days, that'd be great. Thank you, Christina. Um, I would start by saying that emerging markets, it's difficult to envision a time that was better to invest in emerging markets than it is today. Uh, the world is growing. Uh, emerging markets have done a major adjustment over the past 40 years. Interest rates are low, uh, and the prospects of hikes, interest rate hikes, uh, have faded since the March meeting uh, by uh, Chairwoman Yellen. So uh, we are spotting opportunities in many emerging market countries, uh, from Asia, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia. Uh, we spot opportunities in Korea. We have opportunities in Africa. There's a few countries in Africa, including South Africa, but uh, country like Ghana, uh, in some cases, Egypt. Uh, there's opportunities in Europe, uh, Poland, it's a very great uh, currency story. Um, Hungary is a decent currency story. Czech Republic is a great currency story. And then in Latin America, where you find rates, you have currencies, um, you have a lot of emerging central banks that are cutting rates. And so those are very good opportunities to invest in those countries. In a nutshell, uh, emerging markets actually don't need our money. And that's the other component that is crucial. Uh, when you look at emerging markets today, the actual financing needs that emerging markets have are really very small uh, in absolute numbers and relative to history. And so very small flows into emerging markets could, could cause and are causing big appreciation in asset prices. Uh, so that's the other reason why we think emerging markets is a very attractive proposition today. And the third one is um, investors and a lot of rating agencies uh, don't seem to have realized that countries that have their own currencies and have domestic markets are very difficult to break. Um, let's take the example of Russia. Uh, following the 2004 annexation of Crimea, sanctions got imposed, uh, the currency collapsed, uh, the country went into recession, uh, the balance sheet of Russia actually improved. Uh, yes, they have a very special leader, a leader that was willing to get the population behind him on something that wasn't economics, but uh, the truth is having a floating currency and uh, having a domestic capital markets is crucial for the sustainability, the long-term sustainability and the lack of default or the lack of risk of default. So from our perspective, we think that a lot of default valuations implied in spreads are way overstated, especially on the better countries. I'm going to have to stop you there, Ricardo, because yep, I want to give Anne uh, a, a second to respond to that, given the fact that he's essentially saying the rating agencies don't fully understand what's happening in these countries. <laughs> um, can, can, can you speak to that? Well, I can represent Moody's views, and, and I'll just back up by saying, you know, we do see, for the first time in quite a long time, a um, synchronized growth pat pattern across the world. We see um, partly a cyclical uptick, but also partly structural improvements in many emerging markets. And so really this is a, a pretty optimistic time um, in, in history for emerging markets. I would say uh, there are some cases, um, notably Argentina, Brazil, Russia, which are coming out of recessionary periods and are starting to see growth um, pick up. For Brazil, we now have light at the end of the tunnel where we hadn't for many years, and they have come through a pretty deep recession. Um, also, significant adjustment to currency, uh, significant efforts to um, 
bring reforms following Dilma's impeachment. Um, and that has been a real turning point for the country. So there are significant opportunities, um, I think, for um, and positive signs of not only growth and recovery, but also structural reforms in the form of spending um, constraints that the government has put in place. That has really boosted confidence of, um, of investors in Brazil and has started to, you know, we were starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel for Brazil. Um, I think in terms of Russia, the, the point that you make um, were well acknowledged in some of the rating actions that we've taken on Russia. Uh, Russia's rating moved um, down several notches, but it really didn't move beyond BA1 because of the reasons that you mentioned. And so we stopped with those rating actions and stabilized the rating um, precisely because of the very strong fiscal actions and coordinated monetary and fiscal actions that were taken at the time. So I think we, we recognize a lot of the points that, that you made. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there are certainly lots of places around the world where we're seeing positive uh, movement, positive momentum. Uh, India is another country that we feel uh, quite favorable about at this point. We do have a positive outlook on India. We feel like the, um, you know, the demonetization was certainly a risky move and that had some serious consequences. Um, and growth prospects are dimmer today because of that, but that's a temporary phenomenon. Longer term, we see you know, significant structural reforms being taken by the government. Um, and so we, we have acknowledged lots of progress by emerging markets, and I can go on, but I'll pause, pause yeah. there. Thank you. Uh, Wei Hong, do you want to uh, give us your take on Asia specifically? Yeah, yeah. so yeah. thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know, General Atlantic is a global growth equity firm, and our job is very simple. It's to scour the world, look for the highest quality, high growth businesses with great managements and great, uh, great entrepreneurs leading them that we can back. And if you think about where the growth opportunity is, I mean, there's probably no better growth story than Asia. Um, China, India, I mean, those growth stories, I mean, those, that everybody is familiar with that. And I think, um, you know, I won't go into too much detail other than to say that those are the two fastest growing large economies in the world today and well on track to become probably the largest and second largest uh, economies uh, in, in just a matter of years. Um, but there is a third leg of, of growth to the, the Asian growth story, and that's Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is home to about 620 million people, very young, dynamic population. Um, you know, 70% of the people are under 40 years old, and a number of countries have median ages in the 20s. And if you think about, um, I guess, from a GDP perspective, nominal GDP is about two and a half trillion today of Southeast Asia. That's larger than, than India, which is about 2.1, 2.2 trillion uh, right now. And you know, I think most importantly, it has a very large and sizable growing middle class demographic. And you know, I think, why is that important? Because the middle class, at the end of the day, is the consuming class. And you know, that growing affluence as these people come into the middle class, starts with, yeah, start to have disposable incomes. Disposable incomes, in turn, you know, I think drives the shift from traditional retail to modern retail. They, they start, you know, stop shopping at you know, sort of mom and pop stores and wet markets and more into department stores and specialty stores. It also drives a shift, you know, more toward demand for more sophisticated, aspirational goods and services. Instead of drinking cheap instant coffee, they want to drink Starbucks. Um, I think more importantly, it drives the adoption of technology like smartphones. Southeast Asia is the fastest growing uh, smartphone from an adoption perspective uh, market in the world. Um, and that brings me, I think, to the sector that I'm the most interested in, and that is really the Southeast Asian digital economy. So Google and Tomasic published a report last year that sized the, the internet economy in Southeast Asia. Today, there are about 260 million people that are online in Southeast Asia. That's growing at an exponential rate. About 4 million people are coming online every single month for the next five years. That's about 125,000 people per day. That's probably, I mean, it is the fastest growing internet market in the world. And if you think about the, the size of that market opportunity, it's about a $30 billion market today with, you know, I think split amongst three main sectors. I think number one is um, uh, digital media, so advertising, gaming. Number two, really travel online, sort of flights, hotel bookings, uh, ride hailing apps. And number three, uh, e-commerce. And that, that is today a $30 billion market. And I think, you know, Google, according to Google and Tomasic, in about by 2025, that's probably going to be about a $200 billion market. 
you know, and, and Google says it must be true, I mean, that's a staggering six and a half X in the next for 10 years. So if you think about tailwinds and, and macro secular trends that you want to invest behind, to me, I think that's, that's very, very interesting. Penny? Well, I, I am responsible for um, EM fixed income, uh, and I wouldn't disagree with anything that's been said so far. So the question is, you know, emerging markets fixed income last year was the, the index was up about 10 percent. Most active managers were up quite a bit more than that. This year we're up 5 percent um, year to date. So is the trade over? Um, is, you know, has all this good news been priced in? And I think there are really basically three pillars that uh, support uh, the EM fixed income story and obviously uh, equities as well going forward. And they're cyclical, they're structural, and they're technical. On the cyclical side, as Ann mentioned, for the first time in five or six years, you have synchronous global growth. I mean, everything's growing, and it's not growing by leaps and bounds, but everything's growing. So the one engine economy, the U.S., is now a multi-engine economy, and that's really good for trade, and you begin to see that in global trade numbers. It's really good for emerging markets. Um, I think the second thing that's really important is you're beginning to see a widening of the spread between EM and DM growth, and that's very positive for inflows into emerging markets. You've seen that in the equity markets, you've seen it in EM fixed income. Also has a very positive impact on emerging markets fixed in, uh, FX relative um, to the dollar. Thirdly, while the deflation um, story uh, has uh, abated somewhat, you're not really seeing a big pickup in, uh, in inflation. Uh, and so uh, we don't expect that you're going to see uh, central banks moving significantly faster than has already been priced in um, by the market. So those are the and sort of the cyclical factors we think are, are pretty interesting. And then from a structural perspective, as was mentioned by a couple of the other panelists, um, you've had some really structural changes in these markets. Russia, for example, has done an, an excellent job at deleveraging the economy. We met um, a couple years ago with the head of the um, uh, central bank, you know, who said, you know, thank goodness for sanctions because, you know, we were going to have a debt crisis. Um, but sanctions really forced uh, them to incorporate, you know, basically they didn't have access to the international markets. And so uh, corporate debt came down substantially. They've managed the fiscal side of the house very, very well. Um, uh, and, uh, and so we've, we've seen really in the case of Brazil, in the case of Russia, in the case of Argentina, significant turnarounds from a growth perspective and from a fiscal consolidation perspective. Um, and those are opportunities in our view um, going forward. You've also seen um, on the debt side um, a fair bit of deleveraging in the corporate sector. Um, uh, it's, it's still certainly an issue, but um, the leverage has come down. They've focused really on balance sheet restructuring. They've focused on asset sales. Um, Petrobras is, is really a, a poster child for that turnaround situation. Um, and on the, on the sovereign side, um, they've maintained debt in the sort of 45 percent uh, range uh, debt to GDP, which is about half the uh, debt to GDP in, in the um, developed world. Uh, and um, the bulk of that is now in local currency. Um, and that's really, that gives them a lot of flexibility because it's a whole lot easier to repay debt in your own currency than it is to pay debt in dollars. And then the, the last thing I think is really important are the technicals. Our, our um, uh, portfolio has a uh, yield of about 7%, which is pretty attractive in a world where 60% um, of global bonds trade at less than 2%. Are spreads um, uh, generous? No. Um, we're at the tighter end of the spread range, around 300. Um, we're certainly wide to the tights in the last five years of 225, but we're certainly nowhere near the all-time wise. On the other hand, um, uh, yield to uh, vol or spread to vol is, is as high as it's been in a couple of years. So we think the story is attractive. Um, we think that, that um, we'll continue to see inflows. We've seen 27 billion of inflows into our markets in the first four months of the year. Um, in, doll in hard currency debt, in local currency debt, and in blended strategies. We think that continues because while we've seen a fair bit of institutional inflows, crossover flows are just beginning, and we're just beginning to see flows uh, on the retail side as well. So we think it's an interesting story, uh, and we think that um, the relative value uh, opportunity is pretty compelling.
Mona, please. So uh, Macro Advisory Partners, we advise and make institutional investors and corporates and sovereigns on the intersection of geopolitics and politics and financial markets. So um, we spend a lot of time thinking about risks to this outlook. Um, I wouldn't disagree with anybody's take on the upside and positive um, stirrings that we've seen, but we think a lot about what kind of could go wrong with this picture. Um, one thing that just struck me about the conversation on Russia is we've been watching the move um, on the Hill for a new Russia sanctions package that's much tighter, um, that has 19 co-sponsors that could move by unanimous consent kind of at any time, which we think is a, is a shot across the bow related to the midterm elections and some stirring of continued Russian involvement in our election cycle. Um, and so we suspect that that bill is going to get at the ready. There's been a lot of debate about whether um, you would lower the threshold in terms of investments in the energy sector where sanctions kicking and the like. We think it's something that um, markets probably need to pay more attention to um, as that bill gets, gets going. Um, we are uh, very uh, worried about what's been going on in North Korea. It's um, something that we've been watching for over a year. We think obviously it's a potentially nuclear <laughs> event. Um, it, it's not ready to come to a head yet for a couple of reasons. Um, partially the Chinese, I think, want to have another diplomatic run um, before anything they would allow things to escalate. We think the North Koreans aren't quite there at the two yard line when it comes to their nuclear program and the capacity to potentially hit um, the continental US and they definitely want to get across that threshold um, before they escalate. And most importantly, we think the US military doesn't have a strike package in place just yet. Um, although last week there were kind of two developments that suggest that maybe they're getting close, which is the arrival of the Michigan and um, for the first time since World War II, active Marines deployed in theater. So we think they're getting close, um, but we think this, this will play itself out for a while. Obviously, um, all the scenarios are horrible. Um, and uh, I think we'll continue to create choppiness as the situation escalates, but we don't think it's immediate um, for, for those reasons. Um, we're most optimistic about what these guys were just talking about, which is what's been amazing in the, since, since uh, the president pulled away from TPP is the desire, particularly among Latin America and Southeast Asia, to stitch something back together. And also, interestingly, the Japanese very keen to keep, stitch something together, and obviously the Chinese stepping into the breach. Um, our theory has been that um, the Pacific Alliance is a really interesting trade model that is um, very organic, uh, not particularly rules-based. We think it is the kind of thing that's worked very well so far, um, and we think people will continue to, th to think about building on that, on that kind of model. Um, but we're really interested in the dynamism and, and the intersection of, the, of those kinds of markets um, because of all the growth, because there's a lot of um, complementarity in terms of the economies and what the various economies are producing. And we think actually they could be quite um, instrumental in, in building um, really robust growth over the, over the medium and long term. We're less, um, we're more concerned about the fate of um, NAFTA, I think, than people assume. Not so much um, in part because of misalignment of expectations. We think the um, Trump administration has been sending very strong signals to people. They only want to have moderate changes to the trade agreement. Um, but we think both for substantive reasons and mainly for political reasons, it's going to get choppier, um, more choppier than, than not. Um, as you're already seeing, we now have disputes over dairy, over sugar, over lumber. There are probably 10 more to come. Um, but more importantly, we're about to head, obviously, into the presidential election just at the moment that this negotiation gets going. And we think it's going to be harder and harder for the Mexicans to agree to a, tran to a deal um, and create, I think, a little bit of, of uncertainty in the, in the medium to long term outlook. Um, I think that's going to, you see the Mexicans already moving toward shoring up other trading arrangements as a, as a little bit of a hedge for that. But we think that's a source of uncertainty and certainly um, could potentially undermine what the, what the Mexicans are, are um, trying to do in terms of boosting, boosting growth, at least in the, in the medium term. Um, and I guess I'll leave it at there. So given the geopolitical risks that Mona just outlined, and Ricardo, you mentioned this as well, that it seems like emerging markets, is, there's, a, there's a flood of capital there. So given the geopolitical risks, the flows that have been happening, and you touched upon this too, where are the, the, the pockets of overvaluation? Uh, wh where are things getting very frothy? I don't know who wants to pick this up, but um, Ricardo, so do you want yeah. So generally speaking, where we find uh, valuations a little bit stretched is on the high yield component of some, especially some sovereigns 
uh, that do not seem to price the type of risk that countries have experienced, especially countries that are relatively small, have mostly US dollar debt, and do not have a domestic markets to finance themselves. Um, in this rally, we have seen everyone buying everything, and some high yield names on the sovereign space seem to be uh, a little bit stretched. Um, like who? Uh, well, some African names. Right. Um, we find that a country like Tunisia is not doing basically anything to adjust. Um, uh, we find on the credit side, uh, there are some other countries in Africa that we are not uh, finding particularly attractive, like Zambia, a country that has not adjusted, but it has been treated the same way that other countries that have done adjustments, um, like Ghana. Interesting that you're not bringing up South Africa, even though Zuma has taken steps that have concerned you know, investors and, and obviously upset a lot of uh, geopolitics. Yeah, so our take in South Africa is that whether Zuma likes it or not, he's on his way out. He has a year and maybe nine months to go. He cannot be re-elected. Um, that is something that South Africa, we can, uh, we can trust that it will not happen. Uh, the question is more, will he be able to appoint a successor in his own making? Uh, and the truth is the electorate has been moving towards the uh, Democratic Alliance. Uh, it is meaningful that the uh, ANC has lost the three main major metropolitan areas in the last mm -hmm. local elections. Uh, so this seems to be a summa that is just kicking the last kicks yeah. before he goes. Yeah, I think uh, that the, the, his move on, on Gordon and and the change in the cabinet was really, you know, the way we saw it was really sort of a last-ditch um, effort um, to uh, control, get get control of the situation, and and I think the the currency had really uh, strengthened way beyond um, uh, reasonable levels. But uh, when it blew out to sort of 13 and three quarters, we got uh, we got involved again, and I think, you know, I think the the change in South Africa could could um, you know result in something. Upside like a like a Brazil or or an Argentina, but it's very early days and bears some pretty close watching. Now the one area that we are also looking at is contrary to uh, what most speakers here have mentioned that we have seen Brazil Argentina going in the right direction. If anything, both countries are taking advantage of the easy money not to or to slow down on reforms that mm -hmm. are absolutely necessary. In the case of Brazil, social security reform that is being watered down. Uh, it's not something that will uh, break them if they, because they have some time, but it's pretty disappointing that at times when money becomes easy for these countries, then they uh, bring their guard down and they start watering things down. Um, so we, we are constructive, as I mentioned early on. We think that emerging markets still have a long ways to run. We think that countries that have domestic markets, it's very difficult to bankrupt them, uh, but uh, that's not to say that every story is a good story. Some of the most interesting um, opportunities in emerging markets tend to tend to come when policymakers have tried every bad idea, um, <laughs> and then you know then the world withdraws um, uh, capital, which is what happened um, certainly in 2013 around the taper tantrum. And some of the improvements that we've seen in, in these countries has really been driven by no other alternative. Um, and you know one of the things I think. Uh, as an active manager in EM fixed income, one of the things you really want to do is position yourself at an early stage in that in that turnaround process, um, because that's really how you generate mm -hmm. alpha. And I think um, you know I think the Argentina and Brazil opportunities certainly still um, are still attractive. Uh, um, and you know we tend to move you know you can go from the sovereign, which is the first level of opportunity, to corporates and and ultimately the local currency. I think one thing that's interesting for us is the local currency story potentially going into um, the second half of this year. Local currencies underperformed dollar debt um, for four or five years in a row, including last year. Um, it's outperforming now, and I think, uh, and we're seeing increasing interest in that asset class from not only Europeans who've been pretty comfortable with uh, local currency risk, but also from U.S. investors. And I think there, the theory really is you've got a differentiated yield between dollar and local currency debt of, you know, 100 to 150 basis points, so uh, a reasonable cushion. And you're beginning to see um, uh, a much more stability in EMFX relative to the dollar. And with that 
widening and spread between EM and DM growth, you might actually see um, certainly EMFX stability and maybe even EMFX upside potential. So that's, I think, something to keep in mind as you, as you go through the year. Mona, I just want to pivot to trade because you noted a lot of positive developments on that front. Mm -hmm. uh, well, any positive and negative. Yeah. Positive but, and negative, yeah. but you, you, were, you were saying that there, there are attempts to stitch something along the lines of TPP back together. <laughs> I guess the question is, you know, given the administration's more protectionist stance, does U.S. policy have, uh, what impact does U.S. policy and position at this point have on any of those agreements, both positive and negative, for, for emerging markets? Yeah, I mean, one of our theories has been that um, to the extent that the administration runs into trouble in advancing its economic agenda, which we believe is, we're, we think there people are way too optimistic about tax reform and everything else, infrastructure and all the rest, that trade is a very, appeal, politically very appealing um, pillar of an economic agenda because it's wholly um, administrative. Um, and not shockingly, I mean, we'd heard this even before the election that they were looking at the sections that they're now moving, some of these National Security 232, these elements of, of trade law that have typically not been used, um, meaning there's no functioning WTO dispute me mechanism and it allows you to put on bilateral tariffs. Um, and that they've been very, um, they've been looking in history not toward, um, toward the Nixon administration, which unilaterally um, imposed tariffs when we moved off the gold standard, um, put them on, on Europeans as a leverage point for negotiations and later pulled them off. Um, so we think that's, that's a little bit what's going on in the mindset. Um, part of the reason they've done these 100-day reviews, doing these 232 uh, investigations, is to lay the groundwork for that justification down the road um, as a, as a fail-safe. Um, so I think it's um, quite, disruptive. Um, one of the issues that we, uh, they're, they're obviously very enamored with the bilateral trade deal. Um, and obviously bilateral trade deals are very, are very difficult. So we think um, we are worried about the spillover effects of this. We think the Chinese kind of know that this is what's coming. They're okay with steel and aluminum. They, they can see where we're, where we're going. We may end up with some uh, sanctions potentially related to North Korea as well, so they're moving very cautiously. Um, but we actually think the disruptions to the supply chain could be pretty severe and, and in an inadvertent kind of way. Um, and uh, the focus on their, the administration is going to focus on rules of origin and some of these other tools. Uh, Can you give us an example of that? Um, so, for example, um, in the NAFTA negotiations, one of the issues is they've been using this, what they call the rules of origin, which are administrative, that sets the threshold for how much uh, NAFTA content needs to be in a, in a good in order to get free trade treatment. Um, and the theory has been, or what they've been telling people in Washington, is that their, their goal is to push out a lot of the Asian manufacturing supply chain out of by raising the threshold of what NAFTA content needs to have. Um, and we've examined this pretty closely. It turns out there's actually not that much Asian content. There is a lot of European content. And there's also a lot of Korean and Japanese content. You're talking about auto parts? Auto is parts. Specifically? Yes, yeah, auto parts. Uh -huh. um, if they raise the threshold on, on rules of origin, um, it turns out that, yeah, you hit the Europeans and the Japanese and the Koreans uh, in a significant way, um, and maybe the Chinese a little bit, but not that much. And so we think it's not as, um, if that's the itch you're trying to scratch, it's actually more complicated than that, and you're creating a lot of spillover effect um, that's very difficult for you to know until you actually do it, and that's just the way the rules work. So we think um, this is a place where um, the good news, the reason why I was optimistic about it is people are moving on. Um, there's nothing to prevent um, other trade deals from coming along, our theory has been, if another trade agreement, multilateral trade agreement gets going and it gains momentum, U.S. corporates with lots of exports are going to are going to lobby the Trump administration to get a seat at the table. So it'll take care of itself in the end if, in fact, there's something else that emerges. And if there if it does, that's great because it means that the trade there's still a place for trade, um, and there's still a, a momentum for it, which is is really encouraging. I have, I have a slightly different view, which is I think that you know if if you were to ask me the same question in. December or January, I would have had a more negative outlook on the future of our trade agreements with Canada or with Mexico. I think today things have shifted and I'm much, um, I think that the scenario that you, you outlined, Mona, is, is very interesting, but I think it's pretty low probability scenario. It's high severity, low <laughs> probability, um, but a more likely outcome I think is to see a trade agreement that has some changes around the edges. We're not going to see a wholesale renegotiation or abandonment of NAFTA. I think that 
part of the, um, the news and the headlines that you saw last week was negotiating tactics. Um, I think that at the, at the end of the day, what we'll see is some changes around the edges. It may be related to rules of origin. It may be um, cor corruption prevention or crime prevention. It may be um, IP, stricter, IP, you know, IP, IP stuff. IP, IP things, things, things that were present in TPP. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> turns that, out, turns out, that, <laughs> repackaged. Um, we'll start yeah. to see, you know, right. incorporated we totally into agree. this yeah. next generation. Yeah, and to be clear, that's our base case. That it actually the most likely you end up with an okay negotiation. I just think it's going to be longer and more muddled than people realize just because of the timing. And, you'll and obviously if you end up with Obrador in, in Mexico, then I, I, yeah. I'm not sure where that goes ultimately. So we're Does anyone on the panel have a good guess on what the most likely bilateral agreement will be with the U.S.? Do you, do you, do you have a guess as to who we might start talking to about bilateral trade agreements? Well, hopefully our major trading partners, which are Canada Mexico, and Canada. Mexico. <laughs> Canada and Mexico. Yeah, I mean, but we have one. The, we have NAFTA, uh, know, and, and that's not going away. Yeah, I think so outside the, I think of Canada the, and Mexico. The reality the, is the guy is there's a good Trump and a bad Trump, and that's not a moral judgment. It's you know there's the the one the one side is is a growth oriented um, uh, administration. The other is. Is um, is more protectionist, and obviously. Well, he said that he actually said, "I'm a globalist and a protectionist yeah. at the same time." Right? A protectionist. So is you're obviously buying his anti, line. Anti. Well, okay. no, not really. I'm. I'm saying <laughs> it's a question of which way you go, and and it just it seems at at the moment, and I think you guys would agree that that the um, uh, the globalist uh, side is um, is on the ascendancy, but I think the risk is. Is inconsistency. The risk is uh, is moving off, you know, a, a path, and and I think we all have to deal with that from a market yeah. perspective. Um, you know, in, in the case of Korea, how do you how do you deal with Korea? Well, we buy we bought a Korean CDS because it's 60 bips, and it's a it's a pretty interesting option. Uh, you know, it's not going to protect us if the, if it's we have a holocaust, but you know, yeah, it makes it us feel a little bit better. Right, um, exactly. But those are some of the things that you can do around the edges. Actually, I think that the reopening the Korea deal is the most likely bilateral agreement that they do. I, I say that because the Koreans are in the most, um, it, it's it's the easiest one to open up without a lot of side spillover effects. Oops, I don't sorry. think that, <laughs> that's okay. I don't think the, um, I don't think the Japanese really want to do it. I think the UK is interested, but obviously you've got to figure out what the EU situation is first. Um, I don't, I, you know, they're, yeah. So I, I don't really see any others out there that are particularly compelling that they, but they are very keen. I mean, apparently they've had conversations with, with want to do one with the Germans, although the Germans obviously but, can't do one, but that's neither here nor there, but so. <laughs> In the case of Mexico and Canada with NAFTA, Unless, and Mona, correct me if I'm wrong, but unless uh, the Trump administration decides to do away with WTO, they have a very strong footing there, uh, mm -hmm. especially Mexico, uh, being, having the ability to tax twice as much as the U.S. can tax Mexican goods. And the fact that if you actually look at the tariffs that get imposed on WTO products to Mexico, uh, would be a small increase to what Mexico pays today. Well, that's part of the so. reason why I, I, we are a little bit worried about the risk outlook, because there, there is a lot of chatter in Mexico about, you know, mm -hmm. actually people are using NAFTA a lot less because global tariffs are low. The, the cost of the uncertainty is relatively high, and the benefit is if, you, if you're going to have to give a lot of concessions, is it really worth it? So there's an active conversation among the political and business elite of really what are we doing here and why are we why are we the supplicant in this relationship? So that it's the mismatch of the politics and the substance of it that that is the source of the risk. We think. You know, I think you know, just wanted to weigh in a little bit from an Asian perspective. You you asked the question of what happens um, with Asia. Um, I guess now that TPP is probably dead. Probably dead. Yeah, so South and what, what sort of no fill, fills the breach? Pivot, exactly. Pivot to the U.S. So, so you know, I think you know the RCEP is something that's been talked about a lot. I mean, an RCEP is really designed as a program. It's ASEAN plus all its sort of five or six major trading partners. So that's you know that's China, that's India, that's Japan, that's Korea. And I think what what all this does really is just accelerate um, the economic integration of China with the rest of Asia. Yeah. If you mm -hmm. think about kind of where we are, you know, so what's happened with, with global trade, global trade has you know, sort of trebled over the last 10 years. Intra-Asia trade has grown at a factor of one and a half times with that, four and a half times, I guess, in, in totality over the last 10 years. China-ASEAN trade has been growing sort of 10x over the last 15 years. 
I mean, so I mean, I think you, you look at what what this means. I mean, RCEP itself, you know, it's uh, I mean, the trade, the people that are, are are part of of RCEP, at least um, supposedly part of RCEP, account for about forty percent of of uh, just under fifty percent of, of global population and about forty percent of glo global GDP. I mean, this could be a pretty compelling trade agreement, um, which mm -hmm. you know, I think. It's really a lost opportunity for the it U.S. Is, yeah, totally, uh, quite frankly. That's why, yeah. It's and I mean, it's, you know, once again, this this trade agreement is yes, open borders, you know, free flow of goods and services, which you know, Econ 101, it's a good thing, but also I think more importantly, has no labor uh, provisions, little or none, no 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 provisions around human rights and no sort of provisions around you know environmental protections, mm -hmm. which you know are all agenda items that I think the U.S. could have had right. a pretty meaningful yeah. voice on. Which is the other unintended consequence of losing TPP, it's, it's really a lost opportunity, I agree, for, for the whole. But if you look at the individual countries involved, probably Malaysia and Vietnam are among the bigger of the losers. And that's predominantly because the domestic reforms and the policy agendas that they were pursuing um, with an aim to having implemented or being well on the way to implement certain reforms May, may lose traction, they may lose momentum in moving toward some of the things that were going to be involved in TPP. So I think those are probably you know, the two biggest losers coming out of, um, of, of the U.S. moving out of TPP. I just want to open it up to the audience in case there are any follow-ups to the discussion so far. Anyone? Yes. So, um, Penny, I think you mentioned uh, Penny, I think you mentioned that there's, uh, you know, a lot more asset flows going into uh, emerging markets, including from retail, which mm -hmm. I think we've all seen as well. But do you think that actually <coughs> increases the risk that there could be a, a lot more volatility in the asset class? As sure. This yeah. Without doubt. I mean, I think, you know, um, I think there's there's no question um, that that's that's the case, um, and volatility is is very very low. And clearly, we we benefited from. Um, a repositioning um, of flows from, you know, into the U.S. to a much broader audience, and EM has really been a huge beneficiary of that over the last 15 months, and that's always, you know, a risky environment. But in a relatively stable environment um, uh, over the course of the next, say, three to six months, I think you continue to see um, inflows largely from crossover buyers. We haven't seen a lot of crossovers, and we're beginning to see flows from, from uh, dedicated institutional buyers as well. So I think we're somewhere in the middle of it. But $27 billion is a lot of money to come into a, a single market, even though it's a pretty broad market. Um, so there's always the risk if there is a significant um, catalyst for an increase in volatility, that's going to hurt um, you know, credit markets in general, and it's certainly going to have an impact on, on EM. Uh, that we don't see it in the very short term, but you know, it, there are lots of risks out there, as we've identified. And the one big exception to that statement about capital flows is China, right? Mm -hmm. China's had debt outflows for, for some time now. And, and I think it's worth spending a few minutes talking about China because it is such a huge economy. It is um, growing very quickly, and it has some really interesting strengths. But it also has some um, challenging um, longer-term fundamental issues that we can't ignore because they, any kind of a major slowdown in China would likely have significant spillover effects for the rest of the world, mm -hmm. certainly for the rest of the world's yeah. growth outlook. And I find um, that interesting yeah, because you're using, uh, you're using softer language than we were hearing months ago about a potential hard landing. We're not hearing that anymore. So Moody's has never been in the hard landing camp. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and we don't expect a hard landing. Um, in fact, this year we've revised up our growth forecast to six, um, a little above six and a half. Uh, I think the last quarter registered 6.9%. Growth, so we're seeing really robust growth, but that growth has come um, on the back of significant fiscal and monetary policy support. So it has, it is, um, you know, a significant increase in leverage, not just for the central government, who's pumping a lot of money into the economy to help support growth, but also from the broader public sector, which we would define as local government, central government, plus the state-owned enterprises. And so together, the total on and off balance sheet debt across the system in China is, is fairly large. It's grown significantly from about 150% of GDP in 2009 to um, upwards of 260% today. And so the question is, is that debt sustainable? And we do think that China has the financial tools to manage um, this 
level of debt. They've got significantly more growth and inflation than you would see in other advanced economies. They've got um, significant buffers in the form of official foreign exchange reserves, and, and those have come down quite a bit, and you've seen some capital outflows. Um, but it is a closed system at the end of the right. day. The capital controls are quite have proved proven to be a little bit more porous than we expected, and so you're seeing. I'm sorry, are you outflows. saying that the, the attempts to curb capital flight have not exactly worked? Yeah, the, 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 the capital controls have been a little bit more porous than we right. when we than we have thought. But why but is still, that? I'm just curious. Why you know, there and you see this popping up in other parts of the world where right. property values in Vancouver and New York and other places right. have right. have uh, seen an influx one of, of China one capital. One of the problems is, is that. You know, there was a huge dollar um, CNY carry trade, and that had to be unwound as, as you know, CNY was always going to be stable, or you know, and and you know, and, and so as soon as it began to devalue, people people really wanted to unwind that carry trade. That was one of the big sources of problems. The second was the corruption, um, uh, uh, the corruption um, program of Xi. Um, really uh, encouraged high net worth families to try to get as much money offshore as possible. Um, but I think a lot of those those two um, uh, those two drivers have have um, modified somewhat, and you have you know you've got um, uh, rates are up a little bit, capital controls while porous, they're there um, and have helped um, stem those flows, and so you've seen a. Drop. I think that the short-term risk is is, is is really capital flows. I mean, if if capital flight accelerates for whatever reason, I think that's um, that's a short-term problem for China. But I think I I would agree. You know, with your with Moody's read um, that while growth is likely to slow in the second half, full year is probably six and a half, six point six percent this year. So I'm I'm curious on the on on the capital flight only because. I'm wondering if it if it if it signifies the government's inability to control the economy or flows in the way it had before. Is there a, a larger takeaway there about the what the government is actually capable of, of doing and controlling? No, I think I think the government's institutions are are very well and effective. Um, you know, the government certainly controls a large segment of the economy. Mm -hmm. It owns most of the major banks. Um, and in that way, the government has a lot of control over deposits and also over um, lending. And if you have a significant amount of lending going on to companies that are um, loans that are at risk, in other words, loans that are at risk of not being able to pay interest, so where EBITDA doesn't cover interest costs by at least one times, um, the government may have some moral suasion over those banks to extend those loans, even if the, the loans themselves are not commercially long-term viable. So there, there are a lot of tools and a lot of um, uh, you know, institutional sort of levers that, that the government can pull to, to get the outcomes that it wants, and right now it wants stability. It wants right. stability going into the the party fall Congress. party yeah. Congress. But also on the tools in terms of the, the outflows, what we've also seen is I think when they first put them on, as always, when you put a policy tool in place, you kind of need to see how it works. And obviously they hadn't done it before. So there was, people knew it was coming. So you had some people move in advance of that. And to see ultimately, I think they looked around a little bit. So they did a couple of different waves of plugging holes that they noticed once they did the first wave, that there were still outflows that they hadn't quite gotten their arms around. And over time they've been Closing those right. successfully. So, and one of the things on this hard la the hard landing question, if you there are really two, uh, you know, there's the manufacturing sector in, in China, and then there's the services sector, and a, a big part of the rebalancing was to really move um, more from investment um, to um, to you know from manufacturing to services, and you've really seen a hard landing on manufacturing. Um, you have, and what you've seen in services is is reasonable growth, and I think. You can't lose sight of the fact that services is a much more labor intensive um, uh, than than manufacturing. So you've had reasonable wage growth, um, and uh, as uh, per capita income, the middle class class rises, a lot more demand for services. So while it's you know this kind of you know of, of of shift in economic focus for an economy that size is fraught with problems. Um, uh, they've really, they've really done a pretty good job. I think, from our perspective, the, the risks are longer term because 
They've really got to deal with um, uh, state-owned enterprise reform. They've really got to deal with leverage in the economy. And while I think they understand that and they're moving in that direction, they tend to get distracted by short-term uh, concerns. And and the, I mean, while three billion in reserves is, um, or you know, it, three billion in reserves is a <laughs> is a big number. You know, it's it, their runway isn't infinite. So uh, you know, over the next two to three years, they really have to focus on some of these issues. I'm su sure you've got a view too. On, yeah, you know, on I, th China. I think hard landing. The question of hard landing is. I don't think hard landing is going to happen. You know, first of all, I think to even think about a hard landing presupposes that there's political instability. I mean, this is once again a centrally managed economy, yeah. and you know they have. I mean, it's run by very smart, very tactical, very savvy administrators. They're very good at what they do. Mm -hmm. I think you know in, in the past there may have been issues around the the data that they were receiving and their ability to analyze that and take action, but that's gotten significantly better over the last mm -hmm. decade or so. Um, and you know, I think domestic consumption certainly will continue. Yes, um, I think you know it'll take some time uh, from mm -hmm. this transition, uh, but it will certainly continue to drive the economy. Right. Okay. Um, you know, I think you know infrastructure has, has, and infrastructure spending has been positive, and that's not just from a fiscal pump priming perspective, but that's also really to help facilitate consumption. I mean, what they're doing with the infrastructure is to build, you know, logistics to allow the free flow of goods and services. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's this trade, it's e-commerce. And, and that's really what I think will drive uh, the Chinese economy. Yeah, yeah. So all um, of you have uh, great insight and thoughts on, on Latin America and, and, and China and even our own domestic trade policies, but I haven't heard a lot about uh, the Middle East and what opportunities and risks there are given all of the instability there. You know, one of the major events that's happened over the last couple of weeks is the Aramco IPO. And I guess I'd love to get your thoughts on what that IPO says about the stability of the kingdom and the needs um, there and what might, how, how that narrative arc may play out. So, yeah, yeah I, I can start. I think you know, Saudi Arabia has set out a path for itself that is very ambitious. It's got its 2030 vision. It, it is aiming to significantly reduce its reliance on oil, hydrocarbons, and, and all the related industries with that. So if today, Saudi Arabia itself relies on oil-related revenues for about 70% of its government intake. Um, it will reduce that to about 50% by 2020 if their plans go well, and then further <laughs> still through 2030. And the idea is you know, there's significant diversification of the economy, um, and through that, you get a more diverse revenue stream for the government to fund its operations um, and that you will ultimately sustain or even improve what is already very high um, wealth levels and you know uh, sort of living standards for for people who live in Saudi Arabia so you know longer term I think this this is a very long-term challenge that they're facing um, they are coming to grips with and are tackling the potential for moving to a carbon free economy which is which is kind of dramatic if you think about it um, in ways that other countries haven't really grappled with um, and so they you know this IPO is is one step in that direction it's a it's a fairly small ownership stake in a large government corporation that's very important and significant to the economy at the moment um, and what the future state of that company looks like is <coughs> is a bit in question so I guess um not shockingly, I'm a little more bearish about <laughs> what's going on in the kingdom. So I think two weeks ago they had a pretty, um, I think, um, interesting kind of setback on the reform agenda, which is um, they had been planning on changing the benefits and bonuses that government employees get, which is the first of the steps, important steps of the fiscal uh, reform package. Um, and people obviously petitioned the king to roll all of that back, and they successfully petitioned him. So I think people are... Um, um, skeptical about whether or not um, the kingdom has the wherewithal to implement elements of the 2030 vision. Um, if you listen to what Aramco, what the what the company would would tell you, their theory of the case is that Aramco uh, will do incredibly well because of reserve replacement. Um, and we spend a lot of time looking at the disconnect, I'd say, between what the kingdom thinks about the outlook for oil demand generally, and their belief about the U.S. shale patch. Um, and we see continue to see big disconnects 
just in terms of what that reserve replacement looks like. Some of that is adoption of renewables. Some of it is change in policy on the part of China. Some of it is actually outperformance by the U.S. when it comes to um, oil and oil-related exports. So we are a little bit more, it's not to say that they, they aren't going to figure a path forward. And to be honest, um, the, the, they had a plan out that was not clear about exactly whether or not they had the wherewithal to implement it, to fall back to something that is more realistic, um, is great. We think they're going to focus heavily on trying to make sure that they can continue to produce um, gas and other alternatives to oil for domestic consumption so that they still have enough supply to be able to export, because obviously demand is, continues to eat up most of the production that they have, um, which is essential to the outlook for the IPO. Um, and I agree, though, that this is a, I mean, they, they have a fiscal challenge, so they, they, need, the, they need to have the IPO go well. Um, and I think uh, the biggest issue that you hear about this is just transparency, right? Which is, um, Ramco has been around investing in all kinds of things, hospitals and universities and all that. Is, is this going to be, uh, when it's listed, uh, the kind of company where you can get transparency of cost and what people are investing in and what the rate of return is and all that? I think that's the big, the big gating issue for people at, at this stage, which is, can, can you have any assurance of that? And if you've been in the energy sector, um, lots of partners who've done partnerships with Aramco in the past, or any any entity in, in the kingdom, or actually a lot elsewhere in the Middle East as well, is the visibility when you're a joint venture partner into really what's going on in your partnership has been an ongoing challenge, regardless of the sector. So I think that's kind of, that's an issue I think that's definitely going to need to be resolved. And yeah, one thing I should have mentioned is, you know, Saudi Arabia has now 550 billion in reserves. That's an enormous cushion that buys them time to get through this transition. Definitely. Yeah. And you know, it won't last forever. It's not going to solve all their ills, but mm -hmm. it will certainly provide a significant cushion for them as they navigate yeah. these challenging times. Yeah, we also focus that Saudi Arabia was a single big credit in the 70s, and we think it's going back there. Um, the cushion is a great thing to have, but we don't understand why investors are buying those bonds as if they were investment grade. That's all Saudi Arabia had. Um, so we're more on the Mona side of the equation. We don't think Saudi Arabia is a good investment destination. What one area, uh, obviously, one, one country that's getting a lot of attention in the Middle East is, is Syria and the impact, not just on the regions, but potentially on Europe. And you know, Europe is not an emerging mar market, of course, but what is going on uh, in Syria and the Syrian conflict does have major impact. It does have a major impact uh, uh, on Europe, specifically when we're talking about Italy. But just generally speaking, you know, how do you guys see the Syrian conflict playing out, impact on the region, but also outside of the region in, in Europe specifically? So without being an expert on European politics, I have a hard time thinking that Italy could cause uh, disruption in Europe. Um, I see potentially France, but luckily this election that, are coming, that is coming this Sunday maybe puts that to rest. Uh, I have a very hard time thinking that Italy will lead uh, Europe in its disintegration. Uh, my read of history, of recent history, suggests that Italy tends to uh, not to lead. And so, but that's my personal view. Yeah. I mean, I, we are, um, we spend a lot of time on the, on the, I think the big question is what happens with um, Iran and the region in these elections. So we've been, um, the Trump administration is very clearly um, adopting a no tolerance kind of uh, policy when it comes to infractions related to the JCPOA. Um, we think there's a lot of move afoot. You're going to see by the end of the month probably a new sanctions package related to Hezbollah, and, and that's going to add to the stress, we think, in the Iranian system. Um, and then obviously we have elections. Um, and depending on the outcome of those elections, we may be headed to a much more, I think, contentious uh, proxy war in places like Yemen, in places like Libya, in Syria, that in turn is going to spill over even more destabilization in the, in the Middle East and spill over potentially to Europe. Um, interestingly, we, in part because of the Germany deal with, with, with Turkey and a lot more focus on the Islamic State generally, the real um, refugee flows or the real migrant flows are actually coming from sub-Saharan Africa, not, not as much from the region. Um, and um, uh, we think the Europeans have slowly now started to get much more serious about dealing with what is they've now seen a fundamentally destabilizing of their politics as a result of this. Um, 
And so you're seeing them be much more active in places like Libya and in North Africa generally because is this is a really serious. Is it too late? Well, I, I mean, you can get into a whole question about why migrants move. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, our, our view and my personal view has been people, it's just like in the United States when you have people um, putting their six-year-old on a bus from, from Honduras to come to the southern border of the United States, desperate people will move. And there's nothing you can do to stop desperate people from moving other than make their, the, where they're coming from less desperate. So the idea that you're going to put in walls and border forces and people to grab, it, it's, it's a temporary solution to what's a much bigger, much more macro problem that we have in the world. So uh, that's the, the big picture answer to that mm -hmm. question. So no, it's not too late. I, I'm not sure we're, we're dealing with Band-Aids still as mm -hmm. opposed to more fundamental kinds of um, responses, which would take the, you know, the whole world to really pay attention to and come up with more creative solutions on. So I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, we have just a few minutes. Does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Yes. Just actually kind of following on that, um, you mentioned briefly that Turkey really, <coughs> Turkey and Erdogan, to me at least, showed very clearly what it was 18 months ago that, that they control the spigot of, of a lot of that flow into Europe. There's been a lot of fish shaking by the Turks uh, towards Europe in the last few months. Their their little deal that they made hasn't completely uh, fallen apart, but it's it's not looking good. I'll say. Yes. Um, could that destabilize further? Could he turn this bigot back on? And then, what does that do to Europe? Um, if you could just touch briefly on that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the Turks definitely uh, control th that spigot. Again, I think a lot of it's coming from North Africa, and there are different routes, obviously, because you have um, Syrian refugees who are even coming up through Russia and into Northern Europe, right? So people have figured out how to kind of move around. But um, yes, it could be quite destabilizing. Um, we think that Merkel will make sure that this deal stays in place, kind of whatever it takes, at least through the German elections. Um, just like we think the Italians have been talking to the Libyans and people are getting really serious about doing whatever it takes in order to make sure that those flows don't come. Because it's, it's, it's literally, I mean, it's, it's existential for the governments and for the politics. Um, but that's not a permanent solution. So we actually think the, um, the relationship, the US and European relationship with Turkey is definitely one of the central elements to watch, particularly uh, post the referendum in, in, in Turkey, Erdogan's uh, you know, strength uh, domestically. Um, we think it's actually probably the most important gating issue to whether or not there's more destabilization in Europe or not, and really also whether or not the Islamic State fight goes well or doesn't go well. And there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of roiling back and forth. Um, but the, this Iran question and the Turkey question are those are the two main the, those are the two main potential drivers that could put this take, put this in a really much more destabilizing uh, path. Your turn, exactly. <clears throat> Does anyone else have any questions? Yes, you get. Thank you. So regarding new multilateral uh, trade deals that are kind of coming out of EM, one of the big ones was uh, or is New Silk Road. Which uh, countries do you think will be most benefited by that? I, in my view, I'd say Pakistan. And if you could comment on mm -hmm. anything else, uh, that'd be great. You want to take a shot at that? Um, New Silk Road. Wow. Uh, not sure I'd single out any single country to benefit mm -hmm. directly from the new Silk Road or sort of the one belt, one road mm -hmm. policy. I think it will largely just benefit Asia. I mean, ev everything along the entire sort of supply chain, if you will. I mean, these are, are trade routes that have been in existence for long periods of time. And I think this is really just kind of a revisit to the old sort of norms. Um, but, but certainly everything along the intermediate supply chain will benefit. Mm. Great. Well, I can't thank you guys enough for all of your really great insight. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.